the ducks eat the flies, and the flies eat the worms. The Indians eat all three. The wild cats eat the Indians. The white folks eat the wild cats. And thus, all things are lovely. Mono Lake is a hundred miles in a straight line from the ocean, and between it and the ocean are one or two ranges of mountains. Yet thousands of seagulls go there every season to lay their eggs and rear their young. One would as soon expect to find seagulls in Kansas. And in this connection, let us observe another instance of nature's wisdom. The islands in the lake being merely huge masses of lava coated over with ashes and pumice stone, and utterly innocent of vegetation or anything that would burn. The seagulls' eggs being entirely useless to anybody unless they be cooked. Nature has provided an unfailing spring of boiling water on the largest island, and you can put your eggs in there. And in four minutes, you can boil them as hard as any statement, as any statement I have made during the past 15 years. Within 10 feet of the boiling spring is a spring of pure cold water, sweet and wholesome. So in that island, you get your, your board and washing free of charge. And if nature had gone further and furnished a nice American hotel clerk who was crusty and disobliging and didn't know anything about the timetables or the railroad routes or anything and was proud of it, I would not wish for a more desirable boarding house. Half a dozen little mountain brooks flew into Mono Lake but not a stream of any kind flows out of it. It neither rises nor falls, apparently, and what it does with its surplus water is a dark and bloody mystery. There are only two seasons in the region, round about Mono Lake, and these are the breaking up of one winter and the beginning of the next. More than once in Esmeralda, I have seen a perfectly blistering morning open up with a thermometer at 90 degrees at 8 o'clock and seen the snow fall 14 inches deep and that same identical thermometer go down to 44 degrees under shelter before 9 o'clock at night. Under favorable circumstances, it snows at least once. Under favorable circumstances, it snows at least once in every single month in the year in the little town of Mona. So uncertain is the climate in summer that a lady who goes out visiting cannot hope to be prepared for all emergencies unless she takes her fan under one arm and her snowshoes under the other. When they have a 4th of July procession, it generally snows on them. And they do say that, as a general thing, when a man calls for a brandy toddy there, the barkeeper chops it off with a hatchet and wraps it up in a paper, like maple sugar. And it is further reported that the old soakers haven't any teeth wore them out eating gin cocktails and brandy punches. I do not endorse that state. I simply give it for what it is worth. And it is worth, well, I should say millions to any man who can believe it without straining himself. But I do endorse the snow on the 4th of July because I know that to be true. Chapter 39 Visit to the islands in Lake Mono. Ashes and desolation. Life amid death. Our boat adrift. A jump for life. A storm on the lake. A mass of soap suds. Geological curiosities. A week on the Sierras. A narrow escape from a funny explosion. Stove heap gone. About seven o'clock one blistering hot morning, for it was now dead summertime, Higby and I took the boat and started on a voyage of discovery to the two islands. We, have, we had often longed to do this, but had been deterred by the fear of storms, for they were frequent. <laughs> and severe enough to capsize an ordinary rowboat like ours without great difficulty. And once capsized, death would ensue in spite of the bravest swimming. 
for that venomous water would eat a man's eyes out like fire and burn him out inside too if he shipped a sea. It was called 12 miles straight out to the islands, a long pull and a warm one, but the morning was so quiet and sunny and the lake so smooth and glassy and dead that we could not resist the temptation. So we filled two large tin canteens with water since we were not acquainted with the locality of the spring said to exist on the large island, and started. Higby's brawny muscles gave the boat good speed, but by the time we reached our destination, we judged that we had pulled nearer 15 miles than 12. We landed on the big island and went ashore. We tried the water in the canteens now and found that the sun had spoiled it. It was so brackish that we could not drink it, so we poured it out and began to search for the spring. For thirst augments fast as soon as it is apparent that one has no means at hand of quenching it. The island was a long, moderately high hill of ashes, nothing but gray ashes and pumice stone in which we sunk to our knees at every step and all around the top was a for forbidding wall of scorched and blasted rocks. When we reached the top and got within the wall, we found simply a shallow, far-reaching basin, carpeted with ashes and here and there a patch of fine sand. In places, picturesque jets of steam shot up out of crevices, giving evidence that although this ancient crater had gone out of active business, there was still some fire left in its furnaces. Close to one of these jets of steam stood the only tree on the island, a small pine of most graceful shape and most faultless symmetry. Its color was a brilliant green, for the steam drifted unceasingly through its branches and kept them always moist. It contrasted, strangely enough, did this vigorous and beautiful outcast with its dead and dismal surroundings. It was like a cheerful spirit in a mourning household. We hunted for the spring everywhere, traversing the full length of the island two or three miles and crossing it twice, climbing ash hills patiently and then sliding down the other side in a sitting posture, plowing up smothering volumes of gray dust. But we found nothing but solitude, ashes, and a heart-breaking silence. Finally, we noticed that the wind had risen, and we, f we forgot our thirst in a solicitude of greater importance. For the late being quiet, for the lake being quiet, we had not taken pains about securing the boat, we hurried back to a point overlooking our landing place and then, but mere words cannot describe our dismay. The boat was gone. The chances were that there was not another boat on the entire lake. The situation was not comfortable. In truth, to speak plainly, it was frightful. We were prisoners on a desolate island in aggravating proximity to friends who were for the present helpless to aid us. And what was still more uncomfortable was the reflection that we had n neither food nor water. But presently we sighted the boat. It was drifting along leisurely about 50 yards from shore, tossing in a foamy sea. It drifted and continued to drift. But at the same safe distance from land, and we walked along abreast it, and waited for fortune to favor us. At the end of an hour it approached a jutting cape, and Higby ran ahead and poised himself, and posted himself on the utmost verge, and prepared for the assault. If we failed there, there was no hope for us. It was driving gradually shoreward all the time now, but whether it was driving fast enough to make the connection or not, was the momentous question. When it got within 30 steps of Higby, 
I was so excited that I fancied I could hear my own heart beat. When, a little later, it dragged slowly along and seemed about to go by, only one little yard out of reach, it seemed as if my heart stood still. And when it was exactly abreast him and began to widen away, and he still standing like a watching statue, I knew my heart did stop. But when he gave a great spring the next instant and lit fairly in the stern, I discharged a war whoop that woke the solitudes. 